Thank you, Jean, for that, uh, inter uh, that introduction. What I'm going to be talking about today is a, uh, combining all of the research that we've been doing on microaggressions and what I call difficult dialogues in the classroom uh, that deal with topics like race, gender, uh, uh, sexual orientation, and other uh, areas where we talk about groups of, of, that are marginalized in our society. Uh, what I really want to show, I'm sorry the color on this, I'm not sure why it's translating uh, in this way, but the, the color is really off on this, but the, the uh, a book by which, um, and Jeff Mio is out in the audience, he knows I'm shameless uh, in terms of putting up my books for people to look at, but the book that would really most give you an idea of the area of microaggressions falls in this uh, microaggressions in everyday life. The, the book is on your uh, uh, far right, and on the left is, um, in fact, I can't even read it uh, at this point, but it's um, Microaggressions and Marginality, which is an edited book that talks about how microaggressions can be applied that any marginalized or socially devalued group in our society can experience uh, uh, microaggressions. The book on the center uh, uh, deals with uh, microaggressions, but talks about it in terms of mental health and clinical types of endeavors and, and work. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, outline what I see as the major problem in classroom teaching when topics of race, gender, eth uh, ethnicity, sexual orientation come to the forefront. Uh, honest discussions about race and racism in the classroom among teachers, between students, among uh, individuals. It's a very difficult uh, uh, process and dynamics. What we find is that people get very anxious when they have to talk about uh, issues that deal with race, racism, uh, uh, gender, sexism, heterosexism. These are all things that push buttons in people so that our cl the classroom dynamics when issues uh, of these occur tend to be haphazard in uh, uh, many uh, respects. Racial dialogues uh, in the classroom, uh, the, one of the greatest fears that teachers have is that racial dialogues in the uh, classroom will will produce antagonism and conflict uh, between either the teacher and the students or among uh, students themselves. And as a result, they try to dampen it down. When a topic of race uh, uh, sexual orientation occurs and the dynamics become heated, many teachers tend to try to cut off the dialogue in any number of different ways, either telling the students that we have to talk to each other respectfully, that we should talk about this outside, come into my office to do it, but there is an attempt and a fear to somehow dampen down the dialogue on a difficult dialogue such as this before it gets out of control. And this leads me to the second uh, major fear that we find uh, uh, teachers experiencing that makes them avoid talking about these topics. The fear is that they will lose control of the classroom dynamics and it will become the classroom from hell where students march out to the principal uh, demanding that uh, the teacher be fired or to the dean in higher education. Uh, this is really one of the greatest fears that educators have, that in a classroom that deals with a topic like this, that it will become the classroom from hell and the teacher will lose control. And as a result, feel very uh, badly about uh, this particular uh, situation. One thing that we find is that uh, in our studies, it is not that teachers are to be blamed for not being able to facilitate a difficult dialogue on race. What they are fearful of is that they want to do well. They want to facilitate the dialogue so that it is a learning lesson for the students, but they are paralyzed because they do not know what to do. And I think that all of you, uh, all of us who have gone through uh, 
education, schooling, know that teachers are ill-equipped to deal with the emotive aspects in the classroom dynamics. In fact, we're taught oftentimes that teaching is a matter of a cognitive development uh, uh, and inquiry, mastery of content. And in some sense, when you deal with an emotional topic like race, gender, sexual orientation, the teacher, fairly or not, has to be someone who understands process and almost has to play the role of being a, a group therapist. Uh, because that is what is uh, the dynamic that is occurring among the students. And unless you're able to deal sufficiently with the emotional aspects of this, it becomes a very difficult uh, uh, task. In general, many teachers try to avoid or cut off dialogues on race, gender, and sexual orientation. But the silence or the avoidance of the topic uh, leaves what I call the elephant in the room that no one acknowledges or wants to talk about. And it can hang in the classroom and create a number of difficult uh, obstacles to future learning that will, going, uh, that will be going on. Studies reveal that uh, these unspoken differences and conflicts tend to create a hostile, invalidating climate for not only that we'll talk about, not only students of color, if we're talking about racial microaggressions, but also white students as well. And that's an area that a colleague of mine, uh, Lisa Spanierman, is exploring about how racism or how many of these uh, 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 discriminatory acts tend to have equal down effects upon uh, white students or white participants uh, uh, in the work here. Uh, what are the harm that we have found uh, that, you know, first of all, let me say that almost all, if we talk about racial microaggressions, our studies indicate when we've watched these dynamics in the classroom, that almost all difficult dialogues on race occur because a microaggression has occurred in the classroom. Whether it is a curriculum that portrays certain groups in negative uh, uh, fashion and uh, uh, students of color get upset about it, whether the teacher unknowingly uh, makes a microaggression or when other students uh, uh, in the classroom make a microaggression, it tends to create the difficulties that is going on. And by avoiding them <coughs> or handling them poorly, creates uh, a lot of psychological consequences to uh, students of color. Um, these studies, what I'm going to sh uh, show you, is that uh, mi racial microaggressions in the classroom, if not facilitated well, will assail the mental health of the recipients. In one of the major studies that we conducted at Teachers College, we found frustration, anger, depression, anxiety, all the results that many uh, uh, students of color uh, experience if the teacher was unable to accurately acknowledge and facilitate the difficult uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, they create a hostile and invalidating campus climate. Um, and this has uh, been shown to be really you know, uh, uh, detrimental that the campus climate for many students of color, whether in, in uh, elementary, secondary, high school, uh, institutions of higher education, the classroom climate and the campus itself can be hostile to the group identities of those people who are feeling assailed or attacked in one way or, or another. It perpetuates stereotype threat. Uh, the studies that, um, uh, that uh, Claude Steele and many others have done on stereotype threat indicate the, detrim it, it, uh, the detrimental consequences by lowering educational productivity and learning and experience or, or uh, functioning. They interfere with classroom learning. Microaggressions have major consequences. When you, as a student of color, are fe feeling invalidated, 
invisible, um, uh, assailed, your identity is assailed, you are expending considerable psychological energy into protecting yourself, into constantly reaffirming yourself that I'm all okay, uh, and having to ward that off. When that happens, there is little psychological uh, energy left for learning and productivity in the classroom, and we found that it uh, interferes. Likewise, if you look at the, uh, the impact, we're not just talking about psychological effects. Uh, studies are beginning to indicate that racial microaggressions tend to create uh, physic detrimental physical consequences or health consequences for uh, uh, individuals of color. And you can uh, look at a number of uh, studies, even in adulthood, where racism can be, the re uh, for many African Americans, uh, high blood pressure, lowered life expectancy, all of these things are the results of the constant bombardment of racial microaggressions that I'll uh, soon define. It lowers work, work productivity. Uh, the work, work by Jack DeVito at, at Yale now really is central to showing how that individuals, uh, uh, you know, employees of color who experience a hostile, invalidating uh, uh, work climate who are victimized by microaggressions that are invisible to uh, perpetrators, that their work productivity decreases drastically. Uh, another effect is that uh, these benign, you know, oftentimes what happens is that these benign slights, uh, racial microaggressions, uh, have detrimental consequences to people that far from being benign, you know, in fact, when in 2007, when my uh, 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 colleagues and I, um, you know, former students and I, on a research team published the first taxonomy of microaggressions in uh, everyday life, we received uh, uh, letters, and some of you might have read the responses and the American psychologist saying that we were building a mountain out of a molehill, uh, that these were minor slights, they don't uh, you know, have detrimental impact. And our response is that you don't realize that microaggressions are cumulative. They occur day in and day out to individuals of color, to women, uh, uh, to LGBT uh, uh, individuals from the moment of birth. These microaggressions uh, occur, and they are, sim they are symbolic of the second class status that uh, marginalized groups in our society have. And that's the thought that, uh, uh, that is really uh, important for all of us to uh, realize that, that microaggressions remind Asian Americans of the incarceration of Japanese Americans, remind African Americans about their enslavement, remind indigenous peoples of this uh, country of how land was taken away from them and their status in our society. And now, I'm, uh, unfortunately, a number of people are doing studies on the impact of microaggressions and what we call everyday slights and put downs that our white brothers and sisters experience. They are far different. They are much more powerful and detrimental than the everyday experiences that our white brothers and sisters uh, uh, experience in their day-to-day uh, -day, um, uh, functioning. Now, this is something that I wanted to say that Lisa Spanherman also talked about, is that microaggressions in the classroom also have harm, although very invisible to white students and white folks as well. Um, and this is a point that is lost frequently in the conversation. We ask people to change for the benefit so the harm isn't attributed to, um, uh, you know, just to uh, people of color. But in essence, it, we have to, in some sense, harm from racism, racial microaggression, sexism, uh, uh, homophobia, all of these have detrimental consequences to the majority group population as well. And some of the findings that have come out is that it lowers empathic ability. It dehum the, the person who perpetuates or uh, uh, you know, delivers a microaggression 
doesn't have empathic ability when someone says, I found it offensive. Well, that was such a small thing. What are you, you know, the, the empathic ability is not there. Uh, it also dims perceptual awareness. Because as I've written before, one of the greatest tasks that we as psychologists have is to make the invisible visible. Microaggressions, when you commit a subtle act of racism in one form or another, it is outside the level of your awareness. And this is something that I'm going to be talking about uh, very shortly, that um, uh, indeed, what is the greatest obstacle for us to move together uh, in dealing with these disparities is the fact that most people who deliver microaggressions experience themselves as good, moral, decent human beings who would never uh, discriminate against others. They are unaware that they are delivering microaggressions in one form uh, uh, or another. So the perceptual awareness is not there. And as long as you never correct it, that will increase in terms of being uh, uh, perceptually unaware of what is going on. It maintains what I call a false illusion. Um, you know, many of you, um, and we can talk about why is it, you know, uh, why is the world view, if we talk about racism, why is the world view of white Americans so different from the world view of people of color. They are differences between them. And part of it is that people who experience discrimination, prejudice, stereotyping, who are on the receiving end of microaggressions, see it. But the perpetrators, because of their world view, don't see it. Uh, in fact, that is one of the ironies of microaggressions, that on the surface, they appear like compliments. You know, when I'm complimented, Daryl, you know, you speak excellent English. The perpetrator isn't meaning to insult me. They think that they are, comp but they don't realize that they have delivered a microaggression with a hidden message. And that message is that you are a perpetual alien in your own country. You are not a true American. These might seem on the surface, um, and, and when you raise up with an individual, what do they come back with? What an oversensitive person this is. So the reaction becomes pathologized and, and represents another form of microaggression because you are imposing, the perpetrator imposes their racial reality upon the less powerful uh, individual or group that is going on. That's where the pain and difficulty um, uh, begins to occur. It lessens compassion for others, um, you know, and that is one of the things that happens. Microaggressions lessens compassion for others. You don't, you know, big deal. You know, it, you just don't uh, feel that way uh, in one way or another. In other words, microaggressions, unless they are dealt with adequately as a learning opportunity in the classroom, tends to continue the false illusion that no one, uh, uh, you know, that all people are well-intentioned and do not harm others, that real racists are skinheads that they aren't good, decent human beings like you and I. And that is one of the things that I want to really concentrate on. Here are some examples that I'd like to give you of racial uh, microaggressions. A white female student on the school grounds clutches her backpack uh, pack tightly as a black or Latino student passes her. The hidden message that is communicated here non-verbally is that you and your group are criminals. Uh, another uh, example, an Asian American student, like I was saying, and for Asian Americans, you know that this happens to you all the time, uh, that you're complimented for speaking good English. Uh, and the hidden message is that you're a perpetual foreigner uh, in your own country, that you are not a true uh, American. Uh, let's log look at gender microaggressions that occurs here. Labeling, uh, and this happens, labeling an assertive female principal as a bitch 
while describing a male counterpart as a forceful leader. Um, uh, and again, what we have here is that the hidden message is that women should be passive and allow men. Men are the people who make the decision. There are other implications in the hidden message as well. A teacher in class tends to call on male students more frequently than female students. Well, interestingly enough, studies indicate that female teachers do the very same thing. Now, what, when you, what happens and this is where female students at all levels of education may not be aware of, they soak in, is that the, the opinions, the thoughts of male students are more valued than that of the female students. And this goes on uh, uh, throughout life. This is the uh, communication that is going on. And it isn't necessarily that as a female um, uh, in this society, you're aware of it, well, that's what's going on. You soak it in, and it, uh, you know, you soak it in, it becomes culturally conditioned, and you may begin to believe, in fact, that you are not as good as your male counterpart in uh, uh, certain aspects of, of uh, uh, functioning in life. Uh, microaggression example, uh, sexual orientation microaggressions. Uh, this is so common in, in, in school settings where other students who uh, uh, describe another student's behavior uh, or them as that's so gay. Uh, and the equation here is that to be gay is to be weird, deviant, pathological. There is something wrong with being gay. And this occurs all the time in terms of uh, conversations. Now, this is an interesting example. Uh, a lesbian student reluctantly discloses to a close girlfriend that she is into girls uh, and not boys, trying to reassure uh, her that her sexual orientation was okay, the friend indicates that she was not shocked because she once had a male friend who was, quote, into dogs, end quote. Now, there is an equation going on here that same-sex attraction is abnormal, uh, is like bestiality. The comparison here is what is really uh, uh, very damaging. Uh, let's talk about another uh, disability, uh, uh, you know, uh, a microaggression. A blind student reports that fellow students often come up to him and speak very loudly. In fact, uh, the director of our disability center, Richard, Dr. Richard Keller, uses this example all the time that when people come up to him, meet him for the first time, they'll step forward and say, good morning, Dr. Keller, how are you? And uh, what, you know, what Richard says simply is that I can hear perfectly well, thank you. Uh, the assumption here is that one, one uh, a disability like this it, you know, affects the overall uh, individual in terms of their uh, uh, everyday functioning. And the second one that happens oftentimes is a teacher who uses baby talk with a student uh, in a wheelchair. And the hidden message is that they're, they're undeveloped, they're in, in, infantilized, and, and you know, they're infants in, in one way uh, or another. Now, let me um, talk about six basic assumptions I'm going to try to go through this quickly because I, I don't want to run out of time. Um, uh, the reason that we need to understand the functioning of microaggressions is based upon, uh, I wouldn't even say they are assumptions. They are really uh, basic social psychological findings that have occurred. And one of them is that all of us have been socialized into a society in which there exists individual, institutional, and societal biases associated with race, gender, sexual orientation. It is, some people might argue that point, but if, if we talk about, for example, racism, the history of the United States is the history of racism. Uh, you know, in all fair, I mean, it would be to deny a historical reality to say that isn't so. Now, we also have to counterbalance that by saying, yes, the history of the United States has also been the history of anti-racism. But what I am trying to say is that from the moment of birth, all of us are socialized 
individually, in a group level, in a societal level, um, in which we inherit these biases. Some of them we're aware of, but the most dangerous ones are those in which they are outside the level of our conscious awareness. And the second assumption I make is that none of us are immune from inheriting the biases of our ancestors, institutions, our culture, and society. To believe that I have been born and raised in this country for some nearly 70 years now, uh, and to claim that I have never inherited any of these biases, to me, is the height of arrogance or naivete. All of us have soaked up biases and I know that it's frightening for us to see that because on a conscious level, we're taught equality, to be good, that we don't discriminate. And that conscious, uh, uh, you know, uh, conscious training and teaching that we get are at odds with what really happens on another subtle level in terms of how biases are uh, communicated to us. And it's that perception of ourselves as good, decent, moral individuals that doesn't allow us to acknowledge our biases. Because to acknowledge our biases frighteningly assails the self-image that we have as good moral uh, uh, individuals. The third thing that I want to point out is that it is not what I call old-fashioned racism, sexism, or heterosexism that is most harmful to people of color, to women, and to LGBT uh, uh, populations, but the contemporary uh, for, uh, forms that I call microaggressions, uh, and, or what Jack DeVille would call aversive racism uh, in one way or another. Now, to strike this fact uh, home, uh, I, I want you to th think that ordinary folks, when they think about racism, they think about the white supremacists, the Klan member, uh, the, the skinheads. They don't think about everyday individuals like you and me. Now, look at these particular statistics I want to share with you here and have you the, ask you the question, are these due to old-fashioned racism or contemporary uh, uh, forms of, of racism? White Euro-American males are only 33% of the population. They occupy, however, 80% of tenured positions in higher education. They are, well, this changed, eight, about 80% of the House of Representatives. They, over the past few years, they varied considerably, but they are about between 80 to 90% of the US Senate. They are 92% of the Forbes 400 executive CEO level uh, uh, positions, they are 90% of public school superintendents in a profession that is predominantly women. Uh, even more astonishing, uh, uh, they are 99.9% .9 of athletic uh, uh, team owners, and they are now 97.73% of US presidents. Uh, so the question that I really would ask you now uh, should be many. Are these due to old-fashioned racism or due to uh, subtle microaggressions that uh, impact what is going on? Other questions you should be asking are, where are the women? Where are the people of color? And I am trying to say that these are not due to the white supremacists, the clans. Uh, they are due to ordinary people like you and I who go to the voting booths, who determine who we're going to hire, who teach our young uh, uh, kids. They are you and I, uh, you and me, in terms of what, what uh, uh, is going on here, rather than talking uh, about uh, that they are due to the uh, overt racists in, in our society. Uh, the, f the fourth characteristic is that these characteristics that form microaggressions are in some sense invisible, unintentional, subtle in nature, and usually outside the level of conscious awareness. This represents a second major barrier to change. You're not aware of delivering a microaggression. When someone tries to point it out to you, 
and confront you about it, our immediate reaction is defensiveness. I never intended that. You are misreading what's going on. We don't explore because it is so out, you know, the, the cab driver who compliments me on speaking good English, if I was to bring that up to him, he'd probably go away thinking there's something wrong with this individual. Here I'm complimenting him and he's getting upset with me. What, how dare he? I mean, that would be the um, uh, element that, that would go on here. And the second uh, obstacle, uh, besides invisibility uh, uh, issue here, is the fact of our own self-image. When a hate crime occurs, I would say all of us in this room would stand up and denounce it. Yet we are unaware of our own biases that perpetuates and continues uh, uh, to go on. Racial, gender, and sexual orientation microaggressions create psychological dilemmas for uh, both the per perpetrator and the recipient because they represent a clash of racial, gender, and sexual orientation realities. This is what I, I, I don't have time to talk about this, but um, when I talked about worldviews and racial reality, uh, power, you know, most people when we talk about power, we try to say that power is economic might, military might, uh, you know, we talk about this power really, in my thinking, is in a group's ability to define reality. Uh, attorneys know this to be true. If you can con convince a uh, jury of uh, a reality that you're trying to create, the decisions that come out will support your uh, client. Uh, and so if you say that that was not due to racism or bias, you have, in some sense, had the power to impose the reality upon less um, uh, powerful groups uh, uh, that is going on. Uh, the sixth one is that we know now that microaggressions create hostile, invalidating uh, uh, climates that delete or deplete psychological energies. And they not only affect individuals on an individual level, but they create disparities in employment, health care, and education. And they, uh, you know, because it occurs so frequently, it is very powerful in uh, how now, let me now, we've been talking about microaggressions. What are they? Well, microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults, and potentially have a harmful impact or unpleasant psychological impact on the target person or group. Microaggressions tend to, uh, tend to be subtle, stunning, often automatic exchanges that, which are put downs, that are racial, gender, or sexual orientation put downs. They occur very quickly. In fact, they occur sometimes so quickly that the recipient doesn't even have time to respond adequately to it. Uh, and that's been one of the findings that we, we've uh, uh, come up with. They occur and they represent uh, uh, put downs in uh, one way or another. Women in the world of business first referred to this as micro inequities, where they described a pattern of their male colleagues as overlooking them, uh, that they are invisible, they are disrespected, and it seems like their comments are viewed less uh, positively or favorably. Uh, in the work that we did with uh, several uh, Fortune uh, uh, 400 companies like DuPont and Procter and & Gamble, women managers would say that oftentimes they would say something in a team meeting and the person running the, the meeting would not even acknowledge it. The moment that John, a male colleague, said the same thing, the CEO or the a chair would say, Excellent comment, John. Let's run with that in, in one way or another, indicating that indeed the, the women managers were invisible. Now, what do you think the psychological impact is? The communication being you're worthless, you're invisible. You're only here to fulfill a quota. So just sit there nicely and you know, let us men 
do the talking and handling of the situation. These are forms of microaggressions that are very uh, damaging in one way or another. Now, racial microaggressions are pervasive. Uh, they are common and they occur frequently. In a classroom, uh, you know, from a teacher's college where uh, many of my white colleagues have come to me and said they couldn't understand a particular dynamic that went on in class. Uh, a white professor, uh, one, talked about how he complimented uh, a, a male African American student for being so articulate in expressing and bright in expressing his viewpoint could not, under, he was complimenting the, uh, a black student. Why was the black student getting so upset? And most of us would say, well, you know, why is a black student uh, uh, getting upset? Remember Joe Biden when he ran for the vice presidential, I mean, for the presidential primaries, the first Democratic one, was asked about Barack Obama, uh, the Barack Obama uh, phenomena. His comment was that, well, you have for the first time a bright, articulate, clean-looking uh, uh, black man who is uh, good-looking. I mean, that's a storybook man. He could not understand why the black community was outraged by that statement because uh, what is being communicated here is that as a black student, I'm complimenting you because you are an exception. You are so unlike all the other blacks who are usually um, not clean looking, they're dirty, um, uh, unintelligent. You know, that's the message that occurs. And to deconstruct microaggressions is very difficult for uh, uh, individuals um, uh, to do because they have uh, different nuances that, that occur here. Uh, there are several psychological uh, dynamics of uh, microaggressions. Uh, that we can talk about, but I'm going to go over uh, uh, them very briefly. This is, um, uh, in our studies, what we find is that there are four psychological dynamics that uh, uh, students of color tend to experience when a microaggression occurs in the classroom. This is not just sat, uh, uh, limited to uh, uh, students of color in the classroom, and I'm now talking about racial microaggressions. They represent a clash of racial realities. Uh, students of color see it as a microaggression. White students or the white professor doesn't. Whose reality is the real reality? Unfortunately, the answer to that is that the group that has the power to impose that reality generally uh, uh, wins out. The invisibility of bias. Um, uh, how, you know, students of color are placed in an unenviable position because the bias is invisible to all, everyone around except for the students of, of color. Um, and how do they prove it? How do they prove that a microaggression has just occurred? It's a very difficult uh, uh, thing. Um, sorry about that. Uh, perceived minimal harm. Even if I insulted you, it's such a let go of it, Daryl. It's such a trivial, a minimal type of uh, situation. And again, it's trivializing something that has a great deal of pain uh, and the catch-22. The catch-22 being that, um, uh, in fact, this happened to me. Um, uh, on a plane trip, I confronted a uh, flight attendant uh, about her seating, an African-American female colleague and I, asking us to move to the back of the plane. This was a small plane that I uh, 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 wrote about. You know, it's a, it's a plane in which there, one side has two seats and the other has uh, one roll of seats. We were asked, we were the first to come in to begin with, but after passengers loaded, the flight attendant, a white flight attendant, asked my colleague and I to move, if we would mind moving to the back of the plane. Uh, in order to balance the weight, because everyone sat in the front. Well, um, after, getting, after we moved, I became agitated. And when the flight attendant came in to check the over, uh, came to me, uh, checking the overhead compartments, I came out and said to her, do you realize you asked two passengers of color to move to the back of the bus? She was horrified. Well, that, that, you know, I could go into a long story about that, but what was 
really, um, uh, that I learned from this encounter was this, that my uh, 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 black colleague did not support me. Uh, she sat there and laughed throughout as the exchange occurred between uh, uh, the flight attendant and me, and it got quite heated. But when she left, I turned to her, and I said that, why didn't you come and support what I was saying? Because she believed it was a microaggression as well. You know what she said to me? Darrow, it just feels so good not to always be the angry black woman. <laughs> now, what she was saying to me is that as a black woman, when she raises these issues up with a perpetrator, she's dismissed as being an angry black woman. And that is the catch-22. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. If you sit there and take it, you stew. I mean, it works. I get, you know, if I would have sat there and not have raised this issue, I would have, in some sense, uh, assailed myself. What a coward you are. You teach about microaggressions, about what needs to be done. Here you're seated and not doing anything about it. It would have eaten away at me. My blood pressure would have uh, arisen. But likely, when I raised the issue with the flight attendant, she probably thought that what an oversensitive, paranoid Asian, you know, a passenger I have here. You know, so you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, catch-22 that goes here, um, I'm going to not elaborate, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, not elaborate on these four psychological dynamics because I want to uh, really talk about um, how bias is transmitted. And I'll read uh, to you that bias and microaggressions that come out are transmitted to us through the socialization we receive from parents, uh, through the education or miseducation, you might say. For example, being taught that Columbus discovered America while Native American students uh, say, how can we be discovered? We weren't lost. We knew where we were. Uh, in one day, to the uh, policies and institutions. Now, let me read to you an observation that I made one time of a, a group of mothers who took their uh, uh, children out to the playground just to indicate to you how the process of transmission occurs. It was a late summer afternoon. A group of white neighborhood mothers, obviously friends, had brought their four and five-year-olds to the local McDonald's for a snack and to play on the swings and slides provided by the restaurant. They were all seated at a table watching their sons and daughters run about the play area. In one corner of the yard sat a small black child pushing a red truck along the grass. One of the white girls from the group approached the black boy and they started a conversation. During that instant, the mother of the girl exchanged quick glances with the other mothers who not, nodded knowingly. She quickly rose from the table, walked over to the two, spoke to her daughter, and gently pulled her away to join her previous playmates. Within minutes, however, the girl again approached the black boy and both began to play with the truck. At that point, all the mothers rose from the table and loudly ex exclaimed to their children, it's time to go now. Now, it, I would say that if you talk to these mothers, they would be the nicest individuals who would talk about democracy, uh, you know, uh, equal treatment, equal access, you don't discriminate, you don't prejudice. But in terms of what they just did, it was a powerful message to their daughters about certain groups are not right to associate with, they are lesser, avoid them. That is the message. It is very powerful in terms of how we raise um, our children. Uh, I have uh, some other examples, but what I'd like to do is talk about how we overcome microaggressions um, uh, in terms of our upbringing. And we've come up with uh, a series of principles. One of the principles is to learn about people of color. If we talk about racial bias, learn about people of color from sources within the group. 
Uh, students must first experience and learn from as many sources as possible. Um, the media or your neighbors or those groups you associate with are not necessarily the best uh, uh, you know, situations to put your uh, children in if you really want them to begin to learn about uh, uh, people from other groups. Uh, information uh, from white individuals who themselves are unaware of what bias and how it is transmitted is not the way to educate children. So associating with groups of color or people who differ from you and finding out their worldview can act as a counterbalance. And this has to occur not just in pre-K through 12 or higher. I'm saying that we have to do it, mothers, fathers, parents have to do it from the beginning uh, uh, of their uh, uh, upbringing life. Principle two is learn from healthy and strong people of the color, uh, of the culture. A balanced picture of racial ethnic minority groups requires that students spend time with healthy uh, people and strong people of that culture. We don't do this. It doesn't matter whether you have an integrated classroom or not, because in education or in employment, when you're with other individuals, you don't really uh, get to know one another. You don't socialize together. You don't do things together. So I would say teachers should uh, have plans to expose their groups to strong, healthy individuals of, of, um, uh, of the group that they're hoping to understand in uh, one way um, uh, or another. Principle number three, learn from experiential reality. Uh, bias, uh, prejudice, stereotyping is not simply a cognitive exercise. Uh, you have to experience uh, uh, experiential reality is really an all-important thing. I mean, I, I, at, at Teachers College, uh, when I, I run the multicultural counseling class, I ask students, how many of you uh, uh, live in an integrated neighborhood? And a lot of hands come out because despite what Columbia wants you to believe, Columbia is in Harlem, not Morningside Heights that they, uh, car. it's in Harlem. And the uh, less expensive apartments that students get is in Harlem. And so they raise their hands like it's a, a badge of, of uh, honor and uh, courage that I live in an integrated neighborhood. And I then follow up with this question, uh, with this statement, there's a difference between living in Harlem and how you live in Harlem. I mean, that's really all important because most of the students who live in Harlem, their whole orientation is not Harlem. It is the campus or downtown, uh, uh, you know, uh, the lower, um, uh, uh, you know, Greenwich Village. I mean, it's away from, uh, and they do all their activities. They don't necessarily even shop at the uh, uh, stores, uh, uh, grocery stores in, in Harlem. Principle number four, learn from constant vigilance of your biases and fears. Um, you know, we see this in students or any individuals so in topics of race, gender, sexual orientation. Uh, you've got to teach one another and to teach your students that their lives have to be a have, have to. You know, as a person of color, I deal with race every single day of my life. And I simply ask my white students to do the same thing, to be aware, to be, uh, to be aware of themselves as racial cultural beings. Uh, uh, what are their racial cultural identity? Because a lot of people who are white cannot identify themselves as being in a particular race or culture. Uh, they tend to see themselves in terms of ethnic groups. Uh, no, I'm Irish. I'm, uh, you know, um, I'm Jewish, I'm, you know, they'll give all, they won't accept the fact that uh, they are white and whiteness is invisible to them. Uh, so the constant vigilance of biases means you unmask the invisibility of whiteness. Um, principle five, learn from uh, being committed to personal action against racism. Uh, and I guess I'm asking that teachers really do this. Teachers, parents, uh, uh, students have to really be committed to personal action against racism. When you hear a racist joke, uh, 
uh, how many of you say something about it? Or do you let it go? If you let it go, you're perpetuating something that is very negative in essence of, of, of what is going on. So these are the things that I think really are quite important for us to look at as I end today's uh, uh, topic that um, it is very important for all of us to begin to explore ourselves as racial cultural beings to uh, become, make the invisible visible, to own up to the fact that we have biases, prejudices, and to not get defensive when others might put uh, uh, point out a racial, gender, sexual orientation blunder that occurred. Likewise, uh, for all of us who receive microaggressions, it is also important for us not to write someone off. Um, we have to reach out in one way or another to, add, you know, to in some sense, make it a learning uh, experience or opportunity. After all, if I commit a gender microaggression, I wouldn't like to be dismissed without an opportunity to truly understand what I said or did that created um, uh, difficulties for the person who I might uh, feel very positively about. And so I, I hope that uh, all of you uh, have found today's presentation of some interest and help, and thank you very much. Thank you.